for listening to the Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer, and I am here today with my special guest. He is a swashbuckling, sword-swinging actor, author, uh, you name it. I mean, a teacher, all kinds of things. Uh, Teal James Glenn, welcome to the show, sir. I, I really am looking forward to having you on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for asking me, Adam. I very much appreciate it. I have admired, uh, I, I have admired like your career um, from the internet because <laughs> I met you uh, because of Carol uh, Geisander, and I, I just really find uh, what you do fascinating. I think it's really cool, like all the different stuff that you do. Can you kind of give a, a, a brief uh, introduction of yourself for the audience at home? Okay, uh, it definitely reads better than it lived because for me it was just making a living. But um, I've been a, a an actor. I went to art school um, last week, the end of art school. Um, I met a guy at a party, and he was auditioning for people for a movie, and I was an old movie buff. So I went and auditioned. I got the part. Then they needed someone to story about board the, the sequence. Then they needed someone to do the fights. And then I kind of never looked back. I worked as an actor, got trained as a stuntman and a, and a fight choreographer, and worked on hundreds of soap operas in New York, a lot of low-budget movies that show up on cable TV late at night, um, Spencer for Hire TV show. where I, I Oh, Spencer called, for Hire, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Hawk, a clown, then he beat the knockness out of me, um, <laughs> and uh, as I, as he should have. Um, and... Um, and then I went on to a career doing some book illustration. And um, right now I've got, I've written 40 novels. So, oh, wow. Because um, I knew someday it would get to the point where I would eventually always be able to fall down, but eventually I wouldn't be able to get up. Mm-hmm. So I thought about what's, what's going to be the career after that. And it's all storytelling to me. So um, I started writing. And I've, I love that you just said that it's all storytelling to you because that's exactly how I feel. Like uh, movies, film, comic books, books, you know, us talking on the radio, it's all storytelling. Yep. Um, Many years ago, I was at a a comic book convention because I'm a comic fan, and I uh, heard Gil Kane, who was a, a comic book illustrator, a legend, talking, and someone asked him, where do you put comic book artists and writers in the scheme of things? And he said, we are the direct descendants of Homer. Mm. We tell the modern myths. And that stuck with me because pretty much everything I do, I feel that connection. I'm about telling the story with my body if I'm doing stunts or my hand if I'm doing art or my words if I'm acting or my words if I'm writing. So it's all kind of painting this grand mythos and that's what gives people hope to go on and uh entertainment along the way i i love that uh teal i want to give a shout out because i just got a message from um our my good friends terry and darlene dremel um they listen to the show uh, pretty regularly and um actually terry uh writes and produces his own comic book called Steve range comics and Darlene is the publisher. So they, they're indie publishing. Right. And cool. Yeah. So it's so cool. Cause I did not know that you, I knew you were into pulp fiction, but I did not know that you were like a comic book guy like me. I, I mean, I've loved comics since I was a kid. And, uh, why well, I, I actually, I wrote some articles for Marvel, uh, black and white magazines back in the day. And I studied under Dick Giordano, who was a, a big comic book artist and then editor at Charlton and DC. And um, that's what I originally wanted to do was to be a comic book artist. Um, I mean, I did book illustration. I still mm-hmm. do some. And uh, I just wasn't good enough. Re- I mean, that's the reality of it. Mm-hmm. I really wasn't good enough. Comic book artists have to be able to draw a beautiful illustration six times a page mm-hmm. for 50 or a hundred pages. And I just, I, you know, I still draw for pleasure for myself, but um, yeah. And I've always, to me, comic books and pulp magazines and adventure books 
are really all the same, which is why I love the fact that the MCU now is bringing, to, you know, on screen all the stuff that in the schoolyard we do our imaginary castings. Who, who would you cast in the Avengers? And at what story would you tell? And like, and they're doing it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's all connected. I, I, I even did some ind independent comic book work um, as an illustrator, but I just, I wasn't good enough or fast enough. And, you know, I had a lot of friends who went on to major success in it, but, you know, we don't all go the same road. So I went other ways. I, I had people set me on fire and throw me off buildings while they were off, you know, <laughs> building up their art careers. Yeah. Right before, uh, and we only talked for like a minute right before the show started, but um, some of the things that you've done were like Macy Day Parade type stuff. And you were you played the characters. I, I mean, like I remember you posted a video not too long ago where you were one of the characters in He Man on one of the parade things. Yeah, I I was I was the horrible Hordak. Oh on yeah, the, on the He Man and She Ra floats for three years. Wow, parade. Yeah, and um, and then the the choreographer for that got the contract to do the Marvel floats. Hmm. And so I was Doctor Strange on the Marvel floats for three years. And since they built the costume for me, because um, the collar was this gorgeous, big yellow thing, but it was built on a surgical collar so it could stand up like the original comic. Yeah. Um, it was too big and too expensive to hire somebody else. So I was Doctor Strange for Marvel for seven years touring the country. Wow. And including... I played Doctor Strange in a live play that was put on in the FBI courtyard in Washington. Huh. And uh, it was Captain America and Doctor Strange versus Hard Case the Drug Dealer for the soul of this young boy. I got to do sleight of hand, magic tricks, uh, fly in the window, uh, and I choreographed a sword fight between Captain America and Hard Case. Um, and the cool thing... And this is the best story ever because, I, I mean, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it, is because, you know, in the FBI building, you go through a metal detector to go in. And because my collar was built on the surgical collar, I couldn't go through the metal detector because uh -oh. aside from setting it off, it was actually too tall because I'm six foot six. Oh, wow. So with the collar, I was like six foot nine. Oh, you know? wow. And <laughs> so... I would you, you were more like the like, Incredible Hulk than Doctor Strange. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I would walk in and I would go around the metal detector and there would be a line of people. Yeah. And invariably, I would hear some kid turn to his parents and go, Doctor Strange works for the FBI. Because I'd walk in, I'd wave uh, <laughs> to, the, to the guy at the metal detector and he'd just wave oh, me wow. on. Like, He's like, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doctor Strange, it's okay. You know, He could go through the wall if he wanted. He could just um, pour it in. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> You know, so it was it was a lot of fun. And Doctor Strange was my about, dad's favorite character too. Uh, by the way, when uh, when he was growing up, he, that was his favorite uh, character. Wow, that's cool. well. I look at least at that point, I looked like the the Bruner version of, of Doctor Strange. It could have almost been a portrait of me. Um, <laughs> wow, I had very similar thing. And when you're Doctor Strange, you're not wearing a mask. So when we did like mall appearances, they'd be Cap, they'd be Spidey. Uh, sometimes we had Dr. Doom, um, and, but I was the one who they, the kids could see my face. Right. And right. so the ones that were a little afraid of the guys in masks, it was really nice because I could connect with them because they could see my face. Yeah. Um, even cause they, they were two young, younger kids don't know who Dr. Strange is. It was, you know, like, that's kind of a teenage and older kind of character. It was a little more sophisticated, but so that was really the bonus of that is getting a chance to connect with the kids that way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've had a lot of fun doing this nonsense for, for a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is that, I think that's one of the things too, Teal is, uh, for with storytelling it is so much fun, you know, especially when you're connecting and you're, you know, like you said right before, <laughs> we i mean like y'all we literally started talking just a couple minutes before we went live on air and um one of the things i was saying was like i like to have like a casual conversation style or whatever and you you said something like it was kind of like sitting around uh, at, at the cracker barrel talking and i thought that was such a neat uh a neat way to think about it i'd never thought about it like that i'm like oh yeah because growing up when i was a kid 
Uh, of course, I'm 45 now, y'all. So uh, when I was a kid, you could, as a kid, you could be seen but not heard, and you could be around, you know, and listen to the stories. Uh, at least in my parent, my grandparents and my parents' household, and all that. You could be around and listen to the stories, but you know, the adults were talking type thing. And so we, you know, we used to sit around, we used to listen to the stories and, you know, they used to talk about like, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I think it's so funny because today we have these, you know, we have these devices with us 24 seven, these, you know, these smartphones or whatever, but people are not doing like the oral storytelling as much as, you know, they're looking for, you know, the quick little flash on the, you know, social media or whatever Um, yeah yeah i think even like the best of the quote talk shows are some of the british shows where they just kind of get out there as a group and hang out yeah yeah you know they're less less formal than our american chat shows where you get one guest they come on they plug what they have to and then they leave yeah you know and it's much less like a natural conversation i mean you know my parents house it was hanging out in the kitchen Right, right, yeah. That's, that was another one where, you know, that's with the, the coffee. Hung out. Yeah, and, they always, and my, my grandparents always had coffee, and they had like one of those little, uh, I don't know what they're called, but they were like the little square aluminum dining room table, but it was like a dinette table, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because uh, my my grand my we used to go to my great grandparents' house all the time, and uh, they had like a little apartment or whatever. But they had that little thing, and they always had coffee. They were always smoking their cigarettes <laughs> in the little dining room. It was like a kitchen dinette dining room type thing, and you know just. But they were always talking about stories. It was so fun, you know. Yeah, well, you know, that, at the point where you couldn't talk to somebody twenty four seven, when you got together on a weekend, you had a whole week's worth of stuff to talk about. Yeah, now, yeah. Now everybody can, uh, you know, chat you up online, and you get all the little bits and pieces day by day, daily. There's no save up. Yeah, there's know? no di- it's no digestion. It's just complete, you yeah. know, feed, feed, feed. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know that immediacy, while it's nice to have it, it doesn't give a chance for people to collect it and kind of archive it in an interesting way. So when you hear about cousin Betty during the week weekend, uh, you're getting a story mm-hmm. as opposed to each event separate. Yeah. The week. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you on that. And I think that goes back to like what you're saying with, with the pulp and the comic books and, you know, the, the adventure books and stuff that, that you, that you write, um, going back to that storytelling aspect, you know, that, that I feel is better than, you know, watching a movie <laughs> better than, you know, a TV show or, you know, it's not, I, like my favorite music are songs that tell a story and you feel like you're going on this journey to when you're in the story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like that's the same thing with a good book. You know, I mean, like I don't, necessarily have to have some you know read a book that's like five or six hundred pages in order to enjoy the story i could read something in 30 minutes and be like oh wow you know like a comic book for example it doesn't take me 30 minutes to read a comic you know but i could read that and get in a whole encapsulated story with the visuals you know uh of course there's there's no you know there's no auditory with it but you know you you make up like for me <laughs> i used to make up the voices and stuff like you know like with hordak i'd be like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i have that gravelly yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> and uh yeah. but i gotta do the station id i can't believe it's already been 15 minutes already that's crazy um everybody you're tuning in today to the adam messer show here on wruu lp savannah georgia 107.5 fm wru.org we are savannah Sonics community radio with global soul Again, this is the Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer, here today with my special guest, storyteller, Teal Glenn James. And uh, you've got some other exciting news that happened recently, right? Yep. My my novel, A Cowboy in Carpatha, a Bob Howard story, um, uh, won the best novel from the Pulp Factory Awards, which is a, a group of people that... Um, are in what they call the neo pulp community, yeah, uh, the new pulp community, and it's um, people who appreciate the old adventure books from the 30s and 40s, like Doc Savage and the Shadow, and 
also the newer adventure stories, you know, James Bond kind of falls in that, the saint, um, just stories whose primary purpose is to entertain, even if within them they can give you a little lesson or inform you. But the primary reason is uh, joy, just the joy of storytelling. Um, and um, the Bob, it, uh, a cowboy in Carpathia is the, well, backpedal. Robert E. Howard was the man who created uh, Conan and uh, Solomon Kane and Bran McMorn and a number of wonderful adventure characters in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was a Texan, um, never went more than a hundred miles or so uh, from where he was born in a small place called Cross Plains, Texas, <clears throat> and um, was very much the outcast because he loved to read history and to write stories. And, um, uh, and he started at a young age and sold stories to pulp magazines. He actually made more money selling stories than a lot of the guys in his town who were big, tough um, oil drillers and what have you and rough bouts. Mm-hmm. But he, um, although he himself was a big, beefy guy and actually engaged in bare knuckles fights and, and what have you. But, uh, he committed suicide, unfortunately, um, at 35 years old. Mm. Um, he was, his mother was dying of, uh, tuberculosis and, um, and he never, he, he couldn't deal with it. And a cowboy in Carpathia, uh, uh, from pro se presents productions is, um, my homage to him, what would have happened if he had not taken his life? Oh, wow. So in the, the beginning of the book, he makes the choice not to, and then goes on adventure. And uh, in this first book, he ends up um, ultimately in uh, Carpathia, uh, particularly in Transylvania, and he goes up against a particular famous nobleman mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that people might know of. Nice, <laughs> nice. And... Um, uh, and so, uh, it's the first of, uh, a series of books and, um, it's been very well received, which is really wonderful because a lot of times writers put a message in a bottle and throw it out there and you don't know if, if anybody's reading it, let alone how they feel about it. So I've been very blessed to find out some, that some people really like the story and connect with the emotion of it. Um, but it is a rippering adventure. It's not your heartstring tugger, even if it may feel it. Trust me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love I love that backstory because I, I didn't know. I've seen the cover and I've seen the blurb. And obviously, I mean, I have not picked the book up yet. I'm going to be picking it up, though, after we get off the show today. Because I, I just listened to you talk about it. You know, it, it's so crazy. Like you said, you put stuff out there and, you know, you don't know uh, what people are thinking about until you hear from them. And I, I love that description that you gave that you're talking about it because, you know, it adds a human element to the story. It's not just another vampire Dracula story. It's it's about a real, you know, it's modeled after a real person. And, you know, you, you put them in like a fantasy type setting and you say, hey, what, you know, what would have happened if this guy had just kind of stayed here and decided to, you know, take on travels afterwards and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, um, he was a very big influence in my life. Uh, you know, I read, I discovered the Conan books when they were first reprinted in the sixties mm. and, uh, along with Doc Savage. And when you and say Conan, you're talking about Conan the Barbarian? Conan the Barbarian, yeah. Yeah, I see, uh, I did not even know that. And Conan with those Schwarzenegger uh, movies were like my favorite movies as a kid. I, I'm going to have to check this guy out now for sure. Cause I, I had no clue. Yeah, well, the thing is, the funny the thing is, the Conan movies have very little to do with Conan. Um, he's a much deeper, much more interesting character than the movies made him out to be. Mm-hmm. I uh, love the Marvel nice. comics of him too, because he was a lot yeah, the more Marvel of a deep. Comics, yeah, the, the Marvel comics came closer because they adapted a number of the stories, so yeah. you get a little bit more of the flavor. Um, but he's a very interesting character because uh, he. Um, one of the things is the way Howard wrote him, he envisioned his whole life. So he wrote a lot of the stories out of sequence 
some when he was the king and he's older, some when he's in his teens. Mm -hmm. And he, he just, whatever struck his fancy, he wrote them because he kind of had the image of the guy's whole life in his mind. And, um, and because of that, they're very rich, very complex. He created a whole fantasy world, Iboria, that he set them in. Right. And he essentially, he created the sword and sorcery genre. Before him, there were no, there were historical sagas and there was magical stories, but nobody said, let's combine the two. Um, and he literally created the genre that everyone else has followed in. Um, because he was a historian, he really, um, he liked to get things right. All right, let uh, me pause that thought for a second, Teal. Sure. We're going to have to do another show just on Conan now, okay? Like, not today. <laughs> <All right. laughs> We're going to have to do a whole another show because, like, this, I think, is, that, that, like, just listening to you talking about it, I think there's, like, a whole plethora of behind-the-scenes stuff that a lot of people don't know. Like, I, I'm listening, and I have, I, you know, I know who Conan the Barbarian is, and I've seen the movies, and I've read, you know, I didn't read all the comics, but I never read any of the pulp novels. And so now I'm thinking, like, oh, man, now, because this is the kind of stuff that I like. I like action and adventure. I like stuff that, you know, you could just kind of dig into, and, it, you know, you can read it and then put it down and, you know... Because I read every day, you know? Yeah. But there's yeah. there's some stuff like with escapism, you know, the point of it is just to enjoy it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, like, super heavy. Or you could just jump in. And, you know, I like that kind of stuff. So now I'm thinking like. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that, you know, the point is, is that um, you can have a positive message. You can inform your reader. But if you do it in a way that's entertaining, it's almost kind of like, um Putting your vegetables in beef gravy so the kid doesn't notice they're eating vegetables. Right, you know? or making like <laughs> ma ma meatloaf and mashed potatoes, and they don't realize exactly. that you know <laughs> they're eating potatoes. Exactly. Like that. You know? um, I well, love you know, it. So, what do you think about doing a separate show like that? Completely separate show? Oh, absolutely! I'd be all for it. Yeah, is an awesome place to visit. Um, I think that'd I be think the, fun. I, oh. Yeah, you know the thing is, I think we are in a world where we need heroes, and. Um, Characters like Conan who are larger than life and yet have very realistic um, connections. I always put it is that high fantasy is something like Lord of the Rings. Where right. You're looking at the entire vast world with all of these incredible cultures. Whereas sword and sorcery is you're not looking from the palace window. You're in one of the alleys walking through the mud as you're trying to find the treasure. Right. So right. It's a, lo a lot more... Um, nitty gritty and realistic and yet still has the fantasy and still has the adventure um, and um, he even said that he based Conan in many ways on the kinds of frontier adventurers that he read about as a kid mm -hmm. and who were in his family that were you know rough hewn guys but they had a, a moral sense and nothing fazed them well, my um, my dad's side of the family, they're all like from Hollers in Kentucky, uh -huh. and they uh, w <laughs> they were not heroic. They were more like just ruffians, you know what I mean? And but some of the stories that I've read, just kind of looking at genealogy and things like that, I'm like, oh my gosh, these folks, you know, like part part of the historical side of my dad's family, like the ancestry wise, they go back to the Hatfields and McCoys on both sides. And, you know, some of the stuff that I've read, I'm like, this is just crazy. That was never really like a heroic type story. It was all more like, you know, <laughs> they were like the criminals and, you know, different things. And, you know, so I think it's really cool that this guy was able to look at like his family and say, hey, oh, yeah, look, at uh, you know, John. Yeah. Well, da -da -da. yeah. well the thing is, you know, um, well, it's, uh, there's when you're living a life, it's just getting through it. Yeah. When you can step back and look at it, you can go, oh, my gosh, just crossing the Oregon Trail just it was heroic. But the guys living that, that journey in their wagon with their family and the dog and the cow behind it, they were just living their lives. Right. So, right. you know, heroism is a very relative thing. Um, sometimes it can be giving up that extra crust of bread to somebody else 
even though you're hungry. Right, right. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And um, so, you know, that's that's an important element in everything that I write is I um, I look for the heroic. A friend of mine called me, a, you know, a romantic in the old sense of romantic is that I, I think things can be better and I have an optimistic point of view. Even if I write a dark story, there's, there's hope. And I think it's because we need it. I, as a kid growing up, um, Tarzan and Doc Savage and Conan and uh, John Carter of Mars and Captain America, all of that stuff gave me hope because I was a sickly kid um, and um, somewhat isolated. And it, it's, you know, it gave me something to shoot for. And I think we all need that. So I, that's part of my purpose is to write stories that people might aspire to that might give them a little light in the dark. You know, I think that's um, great. Let, uh, uh, let me ask you this too, uh, Teal. Um, and we've got a couple minutes before we got to do the, the station break, but you just said that you grew up as a sickly kid. Um, how, how did it feel when you, you know, grew up to be six foot six, you're, you're very muscular, you know, and then you got to play all of these different hero characters that, you know, children loved i mean especially in the 80s you know like after they lifted the restriction for advertising and children's tv shows that kind yeah. of stuff exploded which led to well, like today's you know marvel type movies and all well the, the interesting thing is that i mean yeah yeah it um i started doing movies i saw chapter two of the adventures of captain marvel a old movie serial at a comic convention in, when i was maybe 14 oh wow and it was the first time I saw a hero played straight, except for the George Reeves Superman. It was the first time I saw a hero played straight with great action. And I said, I want to do that. And then I discovered that who the stuntmen were, who did it, how they did it. And I started making Super 8 movies. Nice. And, you know, and, you know, I, but I was too sick to take Jim. Yet I was, I figured out how to jump off roofs into box rigs. And I learned how to do stair falls by reading articles on the old stuntmen. So I couldn't run a full block, but I could choreograph a fight and fall off something. Oh, wow. So um, I, I kind of got into it as a reaction to the fact that I couldn't do the other things, the sports and what have you. I was lucky enough, comic books, I discovered Judo Master comics and I got into martial arts because of Judo Master. Nice. Um, and uh, all of that kind of pushed me along. The funny thing is, the only time I've ever played a hero was for Marvel. Every time I, in my entire 43 or 44 year career as an actor, I've always been the bad guy. Didn't you say you played I, Captain America, though? No, uh, no I played... Um, uh, and they said Doctor Strange. Doctor I played Doctor Strange and I did Doctor Doom a couple of times at a personal appearance because I fit the costume. And I was the Hulk, which was actually like a 10 foot tall statue you climbed in. What? And it had its own internal air conditioning unit. Oh my gosh. I did, uh, yeah, you could only be in it for about eight to 10 minutes before you passed out. Oh my gosh. So Hold that thought because we got to do the, the, we do the station uh, announcements real Go quick. Ahead. But I definitely, I want to hear more about this when we come back. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Adam Messer Show today. You're listening to me talking with um, actor, author, swashbuckler, Teal James Glenn. And this is WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And Sebastian Messer is here in the studio, and he's going to play a little live music for us. And then we are going to play... Uh, this is our spring fundraiser drive, y'all. So, you know, we're going to play uh, that for you. And uh, if you enjoy the station, if you enjoy listening to the show, uh, you know, please consider at least, uh, you know, take a moment and think about it, about making a donation. Because I can't do this show uh, with awesome guests like Teal uh, and the other folks that I've had on the show. I can't do this without you as the listener um, checking us out and helping support us. We're all nonprofit. Uh, I'm a volunteer. I'm going in my third year volunteering here at the studio and the station. I love it. I love being able to do a radio show. Uh, even if they offer me money, I'd be like, nah, I don't want any money for this because I just love you know being able to talk to the folks like Teal. So 
consider that. That's my uh, my spiel for this uh, hour. I'll do that again next hour. But yeah, please think about going on to WRUU.org and making a donation. Even a dollar, even one dollar can help y'all. All right, so here's Sebastian Messer playing some live music in the studio. listening to WRUU. If you're a longtime listener and haven't yet supported us with a financial gift, now is your time to give us your support. We won't ask you any questions. Our forgiveness is unlimited. You know that you should be supporting this all-volunteer community radio station because you enjoy it and scores of volunteers donate hundreds of hours each week to make it possible. Other listeners are sharing the burden of paying for this radio station's expenses. So why not you? It's quick and easy, and the amount is up to you. And whether you've been listening a few days or a few years, thank you for your support of WRUU 107.5 FM. And, yeah, so thank you very much, everybody. I mean, like, I I know I don't want to, until, you know, uh, you can chime in if you want to, too, because you've been around uh, entertainment industry for a long time. Um, Actually, let me plug this back in because my thing pop back up sorry till um i was saying you could uh you can chime in on this too if you want because you've been in the entertainment industry for a long time a lot longer than me um so you understand you know but we're an all community radio station here it's all volunteer um there and i'm just getting into publishing and you know writing and that kind of stuff and you've been you know you've been doing this for a long time but uh one of the things i love about this station i I found out about this station because I write for the Savannah Morning News, and I had an article, an assignment to write about a um, an event that they were doing called Tunes and Brews, and it was a fundraiser event uh, back in 2018. I think it was like March or something like that when I met the station uh, manager, Dr. Dave Lake, and uh, they had been on air for about a year or so, um, and then the because they're a nonprofit, you know everything's through fundraising you know there's no paid uh staff here not even doc, dr dave who's the station manager he's not even paid he's a volunteer um but i was so fascinated uh because as a kid you know we're talking about storytelling now as a kid i used to listen i grew up in cincinnati and i used to listen to the um the reds on uh wlwt 700 uh, am station and uh used to listen to them i used to listen to talk radio uh, and then there was this one show called the chuck and bozo show which came on at night and then there was coast to coast which was kind of like a uh well it's still around now i guess but uh it reminds me of like the ancient aliens type stuff where they talk about you know supernatural things and whatever um but as a journalist you know and then you know having a love for radio back in the day when i was a kid you know the idea of having my own show being able to talk with folks like you uh you know creators just like i was doing with the newspaper articles but being able to do it on live radio it was like i don't know it was like a dream for me i mean it wasn't like something like as a kid being like oh you know i want to be on the radio i want to be on the radio but it was more like wow this is something that i can do kind of like with the books it's like i can publish books well the thing is with with stations like this and i grew up and we had uh, i was lucky i grew up in new york where sorry for being a yankee but i do come from south brooklyn um but the uh the, we had a number of local cable access and um and public access channels and radio shows um and those were where all the creative minds and all the community based stuff came from. And a lot of them have gone on. I mean, I know a number of people in the, in the industry who all started 
on cable access. We're all started on um, WBAI, which is a, a you know a volunteer radio program uh, station, um, like Hour of the Wolf, and th- programs where you got to interact with local community-based things. Yeah, and that's where all of it comes from. I mean, that literally is um, it's how everyone becomes part of the big picture and then goes on from there. So I, I think shows like this and stations like yours are the most valuable resource we have. It's one of the reasons why it's, it, the FCC says you got to do this. You have to allow this. Many other countries don't have it. Mm-hmm. Many other places don't have free access to the air. So you don't get opposing views you don't get the arts the way we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you say, even if it's a dollar, that dollar for the return on it, for the creative person it inspires or the person who learns a medical fact that saves their life, the return is thousandfold to that dollar donated. I I agree. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing uh, with it, too. I, I'm not a... Um, I don't know how to say it. I believe in what I do and I believe in my work and I believe enough to like share and market it and, you know, try to sell it with the, with the community radio station. I never do any sales. Never. Because, you know, first of all, we're a community radio station and it, it goes against the guidelines, but I never feel like I want to sell on here. I want, I just like, you know, I could talk like it's my show. I could talk about my books all day long if I wanted to. How boring would that be? Right. Well, I think I think what you really are selling is hope and the future. Yeah. Which you can't commoditize, you know. It is it's you could never put a value on the hope, the the information, the connections that are going to be born here. Well, and the point you that know, I'm making it with is like we're commercialized and sold to 24/7. And so for me, doing the radio show, like being able to talk with you about like your creative stuff and, you know, the different people that you know been on the show and all, I enjoy that because I feel like it's a way for people to be able to like learn more about what you're doing without being sold to, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, a way to connect. It's a way to yeah. be part of. And, and, um, like you said about sitting around a Cracker Barrel or like around the dining room table. I've never had anybody tell me that it sounds like that, it, which is really cool to me because I'm like, yeah, that is that is a good way to describe it. I've had a lot of people tell me they enjoy the show. I've had a lot of people say, you know, they had a good time on it. But I've never had anybody because I always describe it as like this is a casual conversation. You know, you and I, everybody listen, you, you listen at home. This is the first time Teal and I have talked on the phone. We've like messaged back and forth on Facebook and stuff like that. But I'm getting to know him just as much as he's getting to know me and you get to listen to it <laughs> in real time and, and so anything that goes wrong it's adam's fault that's right uh, don't blame me it's you my know, it's, i'll take responsibility it's mistranslation it's <laughs> just <right>. mistranslation <laughs> but, uh, you know just as an aside on that i mean this and we don't we don't really uh we do the spring drive and we do the fall drive or whatever um and i do from time to time i'll do uh you know ask people to you know toss the toss the coin out but uh, you know for me i it has been a blessing to to be able to live my dream and be able to you know to do this because i enjoy i love talking with creative people like you um i have so much fun just chit-chatting and you know like the conan thing today i honestly i like conan but i'm not like a conan fan you know but now I have a reason and I have something that I can be like, Oh yeah, I can go check out some of those old school pulp books and, you know, check out your new book. That's based off of the real life author. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, that's, you can never, you know, they, they used to say that, you know, uh, learning is not, is not a finite thing. You never stop. You never, you know, there's always new information. There's always cool thing. And, and even if you don't know why you're learning it, I guess this goes back to trigonometry in high school. Um, you know, just cause you don't know what you're going to use it for. doesn't mean it's not going to be useful in the future. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it's you crazy know? you say that, but, um, like <laughs> trigonometry, <laughs> the study of triangles and the math of triangles. Um, I do electrical work 
And so we use trigonometry and pipe bending for conduits. <laughs> <Believe it or not. laughs> Yep. <laughs> I, I've never uh, literally used it in a work capacity until I got into doing electrical work. So yeah. that, that's pretty cool. You know, it, 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 it's like, uh, I, I don't know if I became a writer because I like to read about weird, interesting facts, or I, I um, learned, you know, started reading weird facts because I wanted to be a writer. To me, there's no connect, you know. I never know when a weird fact I learned 30 years ago will pop into my mind and go, ooh, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. I'm a factoid kind of guy, too. I, I tell you, I I love, I, I know it sounds crazy, man, but I love, uh, like, the corny dad jokes, and I love little uh, brain tickler factoids, you know? Uh-huh. Yep, yep. And they don't necessarily have to be relatable to like the situation or the the conversation all the time either. It's like, did you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm not. People don't like to play Trivial Pursuit with me because I, I really am captain obtuse. I know strange stuff for no particular reason. And, <laughs> captain <okay>. obtuse. <laughs> Another triangle reference. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just because I'm a cute guy. Oh, a uh, cute guy. There you go. There you go. Another you know one. But <laughs> How do you know it's become a dad joke when it becomes a parent? Ah, uh, there you um, go. Nice. nice. I teach kids, so <laughs> I have to have a store of dad jokes available. Yeah. <laughs> I see. I think those are funny. Like, like my buddy. Uh, I was talking about uh, Terry uh, Dremel. His comic book is called Steve Range Comics, and it. It reminds me a lot of those old Mad Magazine comics, where it's got like these different. Uh, I don't want it's it's so funny because I don't want to say like it's like high level stuff that would go over your head if you weren't into that kind of thing. Yep, but nerd it's, humor. Yeah, it's <laughs> nerd humor, but it's not it's not like high level. Like I'm trying to be snobby. You know what I mean? It's more like yeah. If you're if you if you're in the know, like where you're saying, like, how do you know if it's an acute joke when it's apparent or something like that? I can't remember exactly how you said it, but kind of like that, where it's like you if you knew, you knew, right? And uh, I actually, it's crazy, but I actually met Terry uh, and Darlene Dremel because I saw his comic book at a local record store because my son he's into music and we're like, we just popped in one day randomly and it was on the counter. And I was like, what is this? And it, the, the issue was about, because you do a lot of uh, events and you do a lot of conventions and stuff like that. The, 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 the comic book was about convention going and like the different, you know, like the, uh, <laughs> you know, the folks that they're like the holier than now kind of folks. It was kind of poking fun to some of that. And I was like, oh, man, this guy, this is really good, you know. And I reached out to him via his email, and I was like, hey, <laughs> you know, I, I got this little radio show. Let's talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. you know, it, I think that that the randomness of stuff is, uh, you know, they, they say in mystery books, you know, there's no coincidence. And I think right. there's a lot of coincidence, and things do connect and things happen for a reason, even if sometimes it's a bad reason. And um, and also as a as a creative person, the hardest thing is to get out and go outside your circle. Yeah. To meet, you know, to find new people. It's, uh, Mickey Spillane, who used to write the My Camera books, he always referred to his readers as his clients. <laughs> what? <laughs> they're paying. They're paying me. Right, right, you. right. My so, clients. I didn't think about that. My clients. And um, but. As a business person, you want to grow your clientele. Yeah, so how do, yeah. How do you reach new people? How do you, you know, and something like having it on the counter in a music store is exactly the way to do it is the unexpected connection. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Hold that thought because I got to do the station ID, uh, but I definitely want to talk more about that. Uh, all right. Thank you for tuning in today to the Adam Mister Show here on WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. I'm your host, Adam Messer, here today with my special guest, swashbuckling author, actor, storyteller, Teal James Glenn. And uh, I've been having a great time talking about today. I've been, it's been a lot of fun because I'm into that kind of stuff too. Like, uh, like all the stuff that you're talking about, like this, this is like my kind of stuff, 
you know, like the storytelling, the comic books, you know, um, just the oddball, you know, funny type humor. Um, and like you were just saying about the, what was it? Mickey Splane calling his readers, the clients. Yeah. That yeah. with, when I saw that comic book that I picked it up and I was like, okay. Cause I buy comics. I read comics and don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself an avid comic reader, but I love comic books and I do read comics quite often. But uh, I read it and I was like, hmm, this is cool. This is different. I mean, and Terry and um, Darlene, they publish it and then they also uh, distribute it. So they're in like five or six local comic book stores and bookstores around Savannah. And, you know, they make they make it a thing. And it to me, it's so cool because it's like, you know, here he, he had this dream of doing this comic book. And him and his wife, you know, he he does the art and he does all this other stuff. They go together and they they put it out there. Right. And I'm like, you know, that's I, I thought it was really cool because it's just like with you, with your stories, you know, like you said at the beginning of the hour. You put a message in a bottle and you never know who's going to get it. You know, as, as creators, as storytellers, sometimes we don't know when we put it out there in the universe where it's going to land. You know, and I think that's one of the cool things about connecting with other people because, you know, we are, we're all humans. I, I don't ever, you know, look at it like, okay, well, I'm an author and I'm doing this and I'm better. I look at it like, okay, hey, I'm one person with my story telling it to another person who's got a story and so on. Yep. Yeah, and, and the thing is, when you find other people in the community, um, I found that the, the the writing community, particularly the, the new pulp community, are incredibly giving and um, not, you know, how do I put this? Um, they're not as judgmental? They, well, it's not even that they're not judgmental. They're delighted to to read other people's stuff and to make contact with other people who like what they like. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, it's, it, um, it, it no longer becomes, look at me. It becomes, Hey, let's look at this. Yeah. And everybody, yeah. It, it's a, it's a shared community, the writing community. Um, it, it, until you, you get into it, it can be like, Oh my God, they're authors. And then you realize, you know what? They also, um, are not human before coffee. And they also, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they, they also have bills to pay. And they also um, hated the way that story ended. And therefore, that's what made them write their own version. So, you know, you realize that they're, regardless of their different experiences, they all appreciate entering other worlds. And they love it when they can share those other worlds, mm -hmm. you know. You know, like the next day after a, uh, something like, uh, you know, one of the Marvel movies is gone, people talk about it oh, yeah. because they want to share how they felt. And authors are like that. They will share authors that they love. They will talk about, you know, Nancy Hansen writes incredible pirate books. You have to read them. Or, you know, um, uh, Wayne Carey's, uh, uh, you know, uh, thriller executive gambit was like so exciting. You have to read it. And, and it's not, it doesn't become only about them. It becomes about, Oh, let's share this. Yeah. And, you know, and the, that's the one good thing. You know, we're talking about the cracker barrel disappeared because the small communities, but now the small community is anybody who can reach, like I'm talking to you when we've never met in person. Right. Um, right. You know, we've enlarged, the, the village is now much bigger, even though we're still a village. We're, mm -hmm. we're a much bigger village. And um, I'm in a writer's group and we meet weekly. And we've, uh, I think only one of us has actually met any of the others, but we met online and we crit each other's work and we talk about writing. We, we share uh, leads and stuff. And it's all been because of this technology that's allowed it to happen. I got a favor and, to ask you. Yeah. When you see Carol Geisander, would you give her a big hug for me? Because I just love her to death. She's just so I wonderful. Think she's awesome. She, she is uh, my superpower. 
She is my beta reader. Uh, for those who don't know, a beta reader is like the first person who looks at your stuff and will give you an honest opinion. Yeah. Um, and she's such a great know, encourager to, too. You know, as opposed to, um, yeah, it's really nice. No, she'll say, this is really good, except, you know, this paragraph, that mm -hmm. doesn't belong there. She and, gave me some really good tips too. Like uh, when I was putting together the anthology, she gave like, uh, for example, uh, one of the things that she requested that I was not originally going to do, but I did it because she requested it, was to have the author's names next to the stories in the table of content. And I wasn't going to do that originally. Um, you know, because usually in a paperback, you know, you don't have to have a table of content if it's the same author. But, you know, with an anthology, you know, you put in a table of contents or whatever, the stories for different authors. Yeah. Um, yeah, you want to find them quicker you want to be able to go to that author and then you'll work your way forward or backwards yeah you know, but that was there. a that was one of the uh things that she requested and i was like i i thought about it. i was like yeah she's she's right this is a good oh, this yeah, is a no, really she, good idea she's a very savvy lady she uh i said she's a very good writer i i she uh when she writes you you don't realize it uh, you get to some point in the story and you realize she's reached in and grabbed you by the gut <laughs> yeah. and you know gets you with the feels um and, you know, and she writes, she writes suspense, she writes horror, she's written some mysteries, she's, um, she's, she's a smart writer. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm a better writer because she has been there to help critique my stuff as I've gone along in the last bunch mm -hmm. of years. Um, so yeah, uh, I will, I will indeed do that. Um, uh, although these days, not too many people hugging too many people. So, well, I mean, uh, when I it's safe, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> Cause you'll see her in person a lot quicker than yeah. I will. <laughs> yeah. 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 More likely. Yeah. Well, we're both in the, the horror writers association, the, the New York chapter, even though we're both in Jersey, you know, I, I had, uh, talking about that. I had Ellen Datlow on the show not too long ago and, uh, yeah, she is a fun. super nice lady. I don't know if you've oh, ever she, met her in person or if you've been to yeah, one of her things that she does she up there, but. No, she she comes to uh, she comes to the meetings, you know, in pre-pandemic days. Yeah, um, does fantastic fictions once a month um, at, at the KGV bar in the city. But yeah, we were talking about that. Her, That's what, one of the things we were talking about was that that they um, they po they hosted those because of the you know pandemic. They hosted those like monthly online, and yep, that when things are safe, they're gonna you know try to go back to the in person thing. But yeah, they had one this past week. Um, yeah, no, she she's she's great. Uh, she's really fun. Uh, her her cat Jack is is you know a star. Um, can't have, she can't be at a meeting without Jack coming in and sticking <laughs> his butt. Um, but uh, no, I, one of the nice things at Horror Writers Association. Um, I mean, I was kind of a hermit, and one of the first writers groups I ventured in to meet. I used to work as a, a barker at a Hawkins haunted house, mm -hmm. um, and. They were looking for a place for the Horror Writers Association to have their readings because mm. they do readings periodically. Yeah, and um, they happened to come to the haunted house I was at, and I talked my way into getting into one of the readings. Met the people, thought they were awesome, and joined the group. And oh, nice. it's been um, a wonderfully welcoming community too, because you would, it's really funny. It seems that horror authors are the nicest people because they get it out on paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got about a minute left of this hour, uh, Teal. Um, what is the best way that people can check out your website and get more information about your writing? Well, my, my, my website is the urban swashbuckler.com. Uh, but my, my stuff is on Amazon. Nice. Teal James Glenn, uh, Teal T E E L. Uh, James Glenn and Glenn G L E N N, um, and uh, I'm getting ready to upgrade my website, so it's a little primitive, but it's there. Uh, TheUrbanSwashbuckler.com. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot, Teal. I'm looking forward to the next hour or two. And uh, folks, if you're just now tuning in, um, don't worry, you'll be able to catch the podcast on the AdamMesserShow.com. Uh, later on or youtube.com slash Adam Messer. The whole two hours will be on there for you to be able to listen um, as you're going. Actually, one of the things I love too, um, Teal, before we go, is with 
doing the podcast, like we're doing the radio now live and you know, it, it might not be a convenient time for people to listen to right now. Right. But I love having the podcast and, and listening to audiobooks because then you can do it whenever you want, you know, on a travel, especially like travel. There was a guy that said uh, the other day and talking about like storytelling and stuff like that. Uh, There's a guy the other day I was watching his video and he said that he loved playing video games and listening to audiobooks while he was playing video games. And I was like, I like playing video games too. I don't play them that often anymore. But uh, I never thought about like, you know, when I'm just out there, you know, mindlessly playing, you know, something, you know, might be doing a, you know, quest grind or something like that to listen to an audio book. I was like, what? Uh, so <laughs> crazy. But yeah, yeah, multitasking. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So everybody, 